So as I said, welcome to day four of the summer school. The first uh, lecture of this morning is by Giulia Giorgi, uh, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Milan and Karin, and uh, is about cross-platform analysis. So I leave the floor to Giulia for uh, discussion. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to Professor Gandini for your introduction. Thank you uh, to all of you for being here with me today. And yes, as um, Professor Gandini was saying, I'm Giulia Giorgi. I'm a PhD student at the University of Milan and uh, at the University of Turin. I study uh, digital sociology, of course. And my thesis uh, actually deals with uh, memes and generations. Um, I think there will be some time uh, to discuss my, my work a bit at the end of this lecture, but now the main focus will be on cross-platform analysis or CPA. So let's start right away. In this slide, you find the outline of the lecture. As you can see, we will first uh, define the context in which CPA emerged, and then we will try to give a definition of this uh, methodology of analysis. After that, uh, we will discuss the empirical approach to understand um, practically how to do CPA, providing some examples, but uh, without forgetting that like all empirical approaches, CPA also has specific limitations and problems that a researcher should pay attention to. Finally, as I told you, I will show you some things related to uh, visual analysis and my thesis. Now, um, before we start, if you uh, remember that if you have any doubts or questions related to the topics of the lecture, I of course encourage you to interrupt me at any time or alternatively to write them in the box, in the chat box. I also uh, would like to warn you that a couple of slides when, uh, where I present some um, practical examples may be a little bit problematic because they mention sensitive issues uh, like rape or uh, and eating disorders, actually. I've put some trigger warnings on the top left part of, the, of those slides, but maybe I'll remind you uh, once we get there. Okay, having said that, uh, let's move on to the first section of the lecture in which we'll try to figure out what uh, CPA is and how to do it. Let's begin by saying that talking about CPA means, first of all, talking about digital methods, a topic that should be new to none of you by now. As you may know, uh, doing digital methods consists in looking at the web as an object of study. Richard Rogers uh, actually one of the first scholars to have systemized the research protocols for digital methods uh, argues that there has been a conceptual and methodological evolution within this paradigm, which occurred when the academic world stopped uh, looking at the web only to study online cultures and subcultures uh, and began looking at it as a source of data for the exploration of general cultural and social trends. At the same time, the empirical approach to the study of the web also underwent some kind of changes. And specifically, it is argued that scholars moved from the study of web 1.0 or um, 18, um, using the so-called uh, H, uh, <laughs> HTML approach, sorry for that, to a cross-platform approach, which, which is typical of web 2.0. In addition to that, uh, the way in which digital data is collected has also witnessed um, an evolution. So while early studies relied on scraping, in the last, uh, let's say, five years or so, scholars started using the programming interfaces, uh, or API, made available by the platform themselves. Uh, this methodological shift also involved, um, let's say, a renewed attention to the research design, so to the queries uh, for the data collection, and generally uh, an emphasis on how platforms work and organize their uh, content. This in turn resulted in um, a proliferation of 
single platform studies, which reflected methodologically on the platform architecture and specifically on its uh, affordances, a term which loosely refer um, to what platform allow to do in their perimeter. Just for the sake of clarity, we are actually now in a post API era with respect to accessibility of data. And that's due to the fact that the most important platforms have uh, practically blocked the access to their data to non-employees. And very recently, however, uh, like in the past few months, but really recently, some platforms uh, like Facebook and Twitter have started granting special access to the data for marketing and academic research purposes. Of course, uh, uh, they are still deciding the type, uh, the content, the, the, the extent um, of data that people can have access to. But uh, returning to our main topic, uh, I've mentioned a transition from a 1.0 to a 2.0 uh, conception of the web. Uh, so quoting uh, Gerlitz and Helmond, we have moved from a link economy to a like economy. And this means basically that early digital um, methods studies viewed uh, the link as the main object of research. And uh, here I mean link both in the sense of the digital object hyperlink, but also in the broader sense of connection. So those kind of studies actually were close to an idea of InfoWeb, which uh, valued the connections over basically everything else. So they explored, for example, connections among a website, but also among users. Subsequently, however, online content started to be organized around metrics, that is the number of likes, the number of comments, of uh, followers, reactions, um, and so on, which um, have gradually become a yardstick, so uh, a measure of value, both for those who create and consume the, those content, and for those who, um, like the researchers, the scholars, uh, who collect and analyze uh, those com those, the, that content. It is also worth uh, noting that this change uh, from link to like economy occurred within the greater phenomenon of uh, platformization um, of the, let's say, of the economic, of the social and cultural infrastructures, according to which we can talk about platform society. So, as I mentioned, uh, the researchers' attention started to be focused on the data provided by the individual platforms. And in this context, the access uh, provided by the APIs increased not only the volume, but also the complexity of the data collected. So to summarize, uh, the gradual platformization of our society society prompted a type of research that focused um, on individual platforms and was based on large uh, data sets. It should also be noted that the evolution of digital methods does not only involve the techniques, so the methodology, but also, and most importantly, the content. This means that more and more scholars moved away from the analysis of connections to focus on the analysis of events and how they are framed and discussed online. In this respect, Twitter has a leading role that was acquired in early 2010 during the so-called uh, during the period of post-election uh, protest in Iran and during the so-called Arab Spring, when a relevant debate uh, unfolded on the platform Twitter and attracted at once public opinion and academic interest. In particular, in this context, the potential of new digital objects became quite uh, evident, and specifically that of the hashtag, which was introduced on Twitter in 2007 to allow indexing and, gro and grouping of content. In addition to that, uh, the hashtag can also guide the interpretation of the content it marks. Uh, as it often expresses a position with respect to the topics to which it refers. For this reason, the hashtag or combinations of hashtags 
together with keywords, still remain the starting point of many studies that employ, uh, that employ digital methods and therefore also CPA. On this note, uh, it should be pointed out that it is the study of social movements and the collective actions, which by definition spread among different digital spaces, that has paved, uh, paved the way to cross-platform research. So the first thing that we should say about CPA is that scholars adopting this methodology always seek to find, let's say, um, a balance between two opposing instances generalization and specificity, or in other words, between elements and content common to several platforms and other, which are instead linked to uh, specific digital environments. Now, at this point, we attempt to give a general theoretical definition of CPA, which is the one provided by Rogers. So CPA is a methodological approach according to which each platform is integrated into the research design separately with attention to its qualities, uh, to its qualities and opportunities. So on a general level, CPA allows to broaden the scope of the analysis by exploring the ways in which content circulates among platforms. At the same time, uh, this methodology provides an opportunity to reflect on the contingency of data which is considered not only as the product of specific socio-cultural variables, but also as contingent with respect to the affordances, infrastructure and the logics of the platform. Now, uh, this definition, uh, these observations allow us to delve deeper into the theoretical discourse of CPA by putting in place some key concepts. The first one is obviously multi-sidedness, which means that the focus of CPA is on the mobility and on the circulation of content and users across different spaces. Another key aspect to acknowledge is that different platforms are regulated by different logics, which implies that uh, a cross-platform research can potentially have a double focus, one on the medium, and the other on uh, the social dimension. In this sense, Rogers refers to medium research when the research seeks to investigate the structure of the platform. And he talks about social research when the focus is on how a topic is discussed and which narratives unfold from it. Of course, uh, the two instances can and should be combined uh, in some way to understand, for example, how the specificity of the platforms promote um, the production and the visibility of certain content, thus helping to create specific representations of uh, a determined issue or an event. So we have so far provided a definition of CPA and its theoretical framework. Um, now let's consider the practical aspect. So how to do cross-platform analysis? Once again, the answer is provided, one answer at least is provided by Rogers. And that's because uh, he's in fact one of the few scholars to have provided a methodological contribution for this type of analysis. So Rogers proposes a three-step approach to CPA. The first step of, uh, of course involves the choice of uh, an event or um, a topic or an issue that has some political, social of, or cultural relevance. And you can either decide to follow um, the event in its unfolding or to study one that has already concluded. The second step concerns the methodology. So after having elaborated uh, a research question, the scholar should identify both the platforms on which to perform the, the analysis and the starting point uh, or the input for the data collection. In particular, Rogers suggests starting from specific hashtags and specifically to look for hashtags that express the different voices or idea, ideas at stake. For example, uh, hashtags in favor or against different candidates in the case of elections, or pro and against a social cause, uh, like, yes, in the case of uh, same-sex uh, unions. 
Another requirement, of course, is that the hashtag should be present on the platforms selected for the analysis, or that there is at least an equivalent entry point. As for the actual methodology, methodology of analysis, Rogers, that does not actually provide much uh, guidance. However, it can be inferred that the same quantitative and qualitative methods used for any uh, research with digital uh, data can also be applied to CPA research. Um, so if the studies focus, uh, focuses on a political events or a social uh, cause, particular attention should be paid to exploring the topics and the narratives uh, of the debate. Of course, if you adopt a, a cross-platform approach, you are expected to compare the data across the platforms considered. And this means not only to consider the way in which the content spreads <coughs> from one platform to another, through, I don't know, links, cross hashtags, for example, but also to identify which content and voices resonate more on some platforms than on others. Of course, once again, the technical aspects should not be overlooked, and it is important to pay attention to the role of the individual platforms considered in the information economy. Let's now turn to some problematic aspects and limitations regarding CPA. So on a general level, it can be said that CPA shows a range of known problems already faced by scholars doing research with digital methods, combined with a number of more specific issues. Among the most relevant ones, we mentioned the case of divergent affordances. Um, and this is linked to the fact that the platforms display different structures again, and therefore organize their content in different ways. As a consequence of that, uh, this affect not only the type uh, of content that can be created and spread, but also the comparability of the data collected. So a particular case, for example, is represented by those uh, affordances that are present um, in, that are shared by more than one platform, but have more relevance in some platforms than in others. For example, uh, while the hashtag exists on different platforms, its weight on the platform logic is much more evident on Twitter and Instagram rather than on Facebook. But affordances may also be used in a, subvers in a subversive way. And what do I mean by that? Well, taking up uh, the example of the hashtag, once again, there are many cases in which uh, these objects are used to exploit or to circumvent the platform logics and policies. So in other words, users uh, may sometimes exploit the popularity of a certain hashtag and use it to spread unrelated content like spam and off topics, which then obviously can create biases in the data set collected. On a different note, data collection can also be negatively affected by the absence of a clear and identifiable index. This occurs especially in studies dealing with controversial and sensitive issues. When users attempt, for example, to resist content moderation, by making the content less easily identifiable. So I don't know if you remember, but there was this case uh, a couple of years ago when um, a user on TikTok pretended to do a makeup tutorial uh, to talk about actually a social cause, the issue of the Uyghurs minority in China. So she tried to exploit the, 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 the logics of the social media, providing uh, a typical uh, uh, type of content, a makeup tutorial, when in fact she was uh, talking about something else and thus uh, avoid, to avoid <clears throat> content moderation while spreading awareness about this topic. So this is because um, platforms often have a gatekeeping role with respect to the diffusion of content within and across the platform borders. Um, for example, in this in regard, it can happen that some platforms impose restrictions on external connections, like in the case of Twitter, which does not display, do not allow uh, to display on the timeline the images shared uh, from Instagram. Finally, there is the issue raised by non-human actors 
operating within platforms. Uh, that is uh, specifically bots and algorithms. Now, I don't want to go into much detail uh, because this is a very articulated topic. So I'll simplify a bit. Just keep in mind that bots um, and especially the digital traces that they leave behind may represent another potential bias for your research because they inflate the activity around a certain topic. However, uh, the activity of bots is definitely something you might want to keep an eye on because it may contribute to um, other phenomena like the dissemination of fake news or the polarization of opinions. And this aspect has been explored, uh, for example, in the context of uh, disinformation, leading scholars to look for methodologies that automatically detect the activity of bots in the information flows. Uh, last but not least, we find algorithms. Now, as you know, algorithms uh, are the backbones of platforms. Um, because of their vital role, they pose serious challenges for research with digital methods. And that's simply because, as Maris, Bucher, and Zubov tell us, algorithms um, regulate the visibility of content. So they are often responsible for certain, type, uh, certain types of content being deleted or obscured. In addition to that, their functioning itself may give rise to problems and biases, and that's not only in, the, in your data collection, but in your lives as well, given that algorithms ultimately affect the accessibility of content and resources. Unfortunately, unfortunately the ways in which algorithms operate uh, remains to date one of the greatest mysteries of digital research, let's say. And added, adding to that, algorithms can have different characteristics and implications depending on the platform they operate in. So in the end, the main takeaway of this slide is uh, that one needs to acknowledge all these problematic uh, aspects in order to at least try to reduce their effect on the analysis outcome. So after this general overview on the theoretical aspects uh, and on the limitations of CPA, I would like to devote the rest of the lecture to uh, showing you some of um, the empirical applications of this methodology. Of course, since CPA can be applied to a huge variety of empirical cases, the uh, examples I'm going to show you do not exhaust all the possible combinations. To give some sense, let's say, to what would otherwise um, have been um, a list of cases, I have divided the possible applications areas uh, of CPA into uh, three macro areas, which I've called events, populations or communities, and social and cultural practices. So let's move on to the first area, which is also the one considered by uh, Rogers. Usually, this area refers to circumscribed historical and um, or current events, which are typically indexed by one or more digital objects, which is uh, usually hashtags. So as we have seen, this, uh, this type of analysis is typically performed on Twitter, but recent studies have also considered Facebook and YouTube. Twitter often remains uh, the starting point in many cases. So, Existing research pertaining to this area has traditionally, traditionally analyzed political events focusing on, for example, election or voting in general to understand how the debate was structured on different platforms. Mm, the, topic, uh, the topics actually of disinformation and political polarization became also quite popular with the goal to explore um, the role of different digital environments in propagating or contrasting this phenomenon. So for example, Yarchi and uh, colleagues work on political polarization uh, argues that some platforms uh, such as Twitter and uh, Facebook may have a polarizing effect albeit in different ways, while others uh, like WhatsApp would instead foster the depolarization of users. 
Another phenomenon related to this is the banking, which was once again mostly uh, observed in relation to political events. Uh, finally, social movements also lend themselves uh, quite well to cross-platform analysis, and precisely because they tend to be indexed by digital objects that spread, ac uh, spread across multiple platforms. In the next slide, I'll show you a quite recent example of that. But before turning uh, the slide, I'm making the first uh, disclaimer I was talking about. We will be discussing of sensitive topics like rape violence so here we go okay i'm sure that some of you at least those coming from italy are familiar with this case so to briefly summarize it um, around a month ago italian politician and comedian beppe grillo published a video defending his son from a rape charge and in particular he questioned the reliability of the victim's allegation because she had not it me immediately pressed charge, but she had done it uh, eight days after. So responding to this video, this girl uh, named Eva uh, launched the hashtag Il Giorno Dopo, literally the day after, to tell and invite others to do the same, what the victims of violence had done the day after the violence. Her goal was to normalize the fact that in many cases, the victim does not immediately file a report, but it could take months or years even to psychological process the event. Now, this trend was picked up by many users uh, on, on the web, on different platforms, and spread um, like a wildfire in no time, literally. And this is not only due to the timeliness and huge relevance of the topic, but also because the way in which this message uh, is framed and was expressed it is, uh, I say, memetics. And that's it. that is simply, that is easily replicable by everyone. But from our academic perspective, the use of a well-identifiable and effective hashtag, like in this case, allow us to collect data from multiple platforms to investigate how this uh, social trend spread and how people reacted to it. Now, the screenshots you see in the slide are actually taken all from different platforms, including Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, but also TikTok. Now, I will not dwell any further, further on this single example, but I invite you to notice how heterogeneous the material is. And this material features different degrees of multimodality, for, for example, that is combination of textual and visual elements. And uh, this diversity, of course, is influenced by, once again, the affordances of the individual platforms. Let's move on to the second group of cases, uh, of case studies in which CPA can be effectively be applied, which deals with users and online communities. Here, once again, I'm letting out another trigger warning, the last one I promise, because at some point I will be talking about eating disorders. So according to the division I operated, this group includes uh, those studies mapping and exploring specific communities which inhabit or move across platforms. In this case, uh, scholars are faced with the challenge of tracking down the users across social media. Uh, because assuming the fact that each platform provides unique affordances, users populate each digital space in a specific way. And this means, for example, that users present themselves quite differently and interact in different ways depending on the cultural and the technical logics regulating the platforms. This makes ultimately very difficult to follow, uh, for scholars to follow and trace the users' activities ac across different digital uh, environments. There are, of course, cases in which things get really easy because the users themselves provide access to their different social media profiles, for example, through a landing page. But other times, we are not so lucky. I'm talking about the cases uh, of groups and other communities that have a specific reason to remain anonymous such as, for example, pro-ANA or pro-ED, that is pro-anorexia uh, and pro-eating disorders groups, 
which were studied uh, specifically by Gerard on uh, Pinterest. In particular, this scholar noticed that this, uh, the profiles associated with this type of content um, used hashtags and content that were not explicitly supporting anorexia, but were instead pro-sport, pro-fitness lifestyle, and they even included similar hashtags and disclaimers in their account bios. So for example, they, um, they claim, I'm not pro anything, I'm not pro ED, I'm pro life, I'm pro fitness, I'm pro a healthy lifestyle, and so on. Allegedly, this strategy fun functioned uh, like a secret code insofar as other users were able to understand that the account was pro anorexia. But at the same time, this prevented the user to be spotted and censored by the platform moderation. Now, out of curiosity, I've recently done a similar search on Twitter and found out that apparently users do not bother to conceal their support uh, for eating disorders in the same way they uh, did on Pinterest. Instead, I found out that they use quite explicit hashtags and post explicit pro uh, anorexia content. Some of them even share links to Telegram aid groups that they created with the aim of motivating other people to pursue this lifestyle. And this from an academic, academic uh, perspective is really interesting and helpful because it, does, it allows scholars to have an entry point from, for a cross-platform analysis and follow th this group of uh, users in their migration, let's say, from Twitter to Telegram in this case. So once again, the CPA approach can be employed to map these groups and how they use different platforms to interact. With this respect, I can bring another example. Um, so together with Professor Caliandro and Professor Gravaglia, we have decided to use a cross-platform approach to identify uh, communities of riders in the, mil in the area of Milan. And specifically, we focused on the case of Deliver. So assuming that Deliver riders use different platforms to talk about their job, we tried to look for markers which could help us identify profiles of riders. And with this aim, uh, our analysis covers different platforms, actually, including uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and even uh, TikTok. Part of our data collection was carried out using this tool called CrowdTangle, which is uh, an analytical tool made uh, available by, by Facebook that allows scholars to perform personalizable queries on platforms like Facebook, Instagram, but also Reddit and, uh, and Twitter. Now, the possibility to perform the very same search uh, possibly on multiple platforms facilitates a cross-platform approach. In our case, uh, the tool allowed us to find pages and groups dedicated to riders and thus populated by riders, both on Facebook and on Instagram from which we have collected, of course, data, but also we, have, um, we were allowed to track down the profiles which were, we, we were interested in, so profiles of riders. Okay, let's now move on to the third and final uh, macro area of CPA applications, which I have called sociocultural phenomena and practices. An example of this type of study concerns the investigation of how identity is construct and expressed across multiple digital environments, but also how users deal with more sensitive issues like privacy and security online. A similar study was conducted by Miguel and colleagues who have investigated how users preserve and negotiate their intimacy when moving across platforms with different degree, degrees of anonymity, specifically in looking at the case of users migrating from a platform with a semi-anonymous structure like Couchsurfing to a more personalized one like Facebook. Another interesting example is, one, uh, is the one my colleague 
Ilir is working on, although his studies does not impl employ a cross-platform approach. More specifically, his work deals with self-censorship practices on Reddit, a topic that allows him, among other things, to study the implicit knowledge that users have of the social norms and the algorithm algorithmic logics that shape interactions on Reddit. Of course, all of these cases must take into account the problems and limitations uh, already explained before, coupled with other problematic aspects that arise every time we deal with uh, sensitive information and which Hall and colleagues describe as an increased risk of confidentiality breaches. That is simply an increased risk of incurring in sensitive data and privacy breaches. Um, yes. Okay, as we are approaching our last example, I would like to open a parenthesis on a particular type of CPA, that is visual uh, cross-platform analysis. And this approach was de developed in response uh, to the increasingly relevant role played by visual content on many platforms. As the name suggests, a visual CPA <clears throat> takes the image as a starting point for a cross-platform analysis. And this approach can effectively be applied uh, when studying, for example, the so-called platform vernaculars, that is languages, actual dialects that characterize interactions on a platform and which arise from a combination of technical properties and social aspects. So for example, memes, can be understood as the expression of a platform vernacular because their structure is not only determined by the affordances of the platform, but also by the sociocultural context in which they are created. To put it simply, the fact that memes on TikTok are old videos depends on the affordances of the platform, but the appropriate <coughs> structure, the content of those memes is actually collectively decided and negotiated by, by the users of the platform. Now, going back to visual uh, cross-platform analysis, it should be noted that, of course, it presents a whole new series of problems and biases, such as, for example, the fact that most analytical tools and softwares are rather oriented towards texts rather than on uh, images. Although the already mentioned CrowdTangle uh, allows us to carry out a search for images as well and uh, what they call a meme search. And on that note, there is also another uh, site called the Meme Gene, which uh, I've put the link in the slide and I'll be showing you uh, in a moment. Another question uh, concerns the way in, in which visual data should be analyzed and compared. And a possible answer to this was provided by the study uh, carried out by Pierce and colleagues who analyzed how, um, using, of course, a, a cross-platform perspective, uh, the production of images around the topic of climate change. So in this slide, you see, uh, you can see three types, the three types actually of analysis um, and of techniques that they adopted. One uh, was to create a network with Jeffy where the nodes represented the images and the connection, uh, the hashtags with which the images were uh, tagged, were marked. So in this way, the regular network analysis is repurposed so as to keep track of the visual data. Another possibility uh, is to create layered images. And as you can see here, the authors have super, uh, superimposed in various layers, images displaying similar patterns in order to create a sort of uh, summary of the visual style of the different platforms. The last strategy is represented by image plots, which rely on, uh, simply put, previously trained algorithms to organize and cluster images based on uh, visual properties, can be colors, but also pixels. These in the slide are created with the image sorter software, 
uh, which you have already seen uh, during yesterday's lecture. As you know, image sorter groups Im images uh, on the basis of the color. However, there are also other resources that cluster images on the basis of pixel similarity. Uh, this is the case of Pixplot, a library running on Python, which I really enjoy. And it's a little bit less intuitive uh, that, than image sorter, just because it requires both Python and a basic knowledge of programming. However, some people of the Nostalgia group have successfully managed to download and use it a couple of days ago. So I'll be doing, I'm very confident that all of you can, uh, if, if you want, apply it for your research. So I'll be doing a little demo of that as well at the end. Before getting to it, however, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my thesis, which from a methodological point of view applies what has been already said uh, so far about uh, CPA and in particular about visual cross-platform analysis. So as, as I anticipated, my thesis deals with memes and to be more precise, my thesis tries to combine two great concepts, memes and generations. The basic assumption is that memes are used by many, if not all, generational groups to somehow express their allegiance to a generation. And my main research question is, uh, how do memes help or contribute to create the, uh, a generational or generational identities in general? So as you can see, on the one hand, we have the concept of meme with its theoretical definition given by the literature that identifies them as multimodal digital objects that combine elements from pop culture to convey an often humorous message. However, in order to identify memes within my data set, I also needed an operational definition of them. And I describe memes as digital objects that display some kind of uh, manipulation and be it text line insertion or image editing. Another thing to consider is memes pervasiveness which means that memes are the quintessential cross-platform phenomenon. So for reasons of demographic size and accessibility of data, I took Instagram as a starting point uh, for my research and I downloaded a bit, quite many, many posts tagged with uh, the hashtag Meme Italiani, which is Italian memes. And after reducing the sample, I ran hashtags and uh, visual analysis and actually made a huge discovery. Basically, um, I discovered that my data set was really homogeneous, both in terms of content and structure. What I mean by that is that those memes seem to be created by and for a certain user base, namely high school teenagers and or university students. So I wondered where are the other memes? The answer I gave myself is that uh, my approach could basically have two major problems. One is that Instagram was mainly, is mainly um, populated by a young user base. And the second issue was probably in the way that the, that content is indexed. In other words, I assumed that there were memes which were not necessarily tagged or even conceived as memes but that in fact, according to my analytical definition, were memes. Lucky for me, I had another entry point that is generations. So skipping all the theoretical stuff, believe me on the fact that I did some research, I performed a second data collection with Croctangle this time on both Instagram and Facebook. This query was directed at finding generational groups and at collecting the visual content published by these pages. What I came up with was, aside from a very ugly set of memes, like the ones you see in the slide, sorry for non-Italian speakers, you cannot truly enjoy the cringiness of these memes. What I came up with was a set of quite differently built memes, which mostly relied on nostalgia instead uh, of humor. So 
On this visual material that I collected, I was able to perform the visual cross-platform analysis, mainly through semi-automated and uh, qualitative uh, methods. So for example, in the slide, you see um, an image plot that I created with Pixplot. Um, and then during the semi-structured interviews that I organized, I had the opportunity to discuss with my interviewees uh, their understanding of memes and the generational connotation uh, behind this label. Okay, so with that being said, we are basically at the end of this lecture, which I hope you enjoyed and was not too stressful for you. In a couple of minutes, I will be demonstrating to you two tools. One is the already mentioned Pixplot, which can be used to uh, create image maps. And the other is um, a very simple a user and user-friendly image tagger called uh, Meme Spectre. But before doing that, I'll just conclude the lecture with a couple of final remarks on CPA and its key points. So as we have seen, cross-platform analysis is a research strategy that relies on digital methods, thus inheriting many of the possibilities, but also some limitations from them. Last but not least, I would like to stress the fact that cross-platform analysis, of course, is not a better or a worse approach as compared to others, just a different perspective from which to observe things. And it is, uh, of course, it should be your research interests coupled with your research questions to guide uh, you uh, towards, to guide your choice towards uh, cross-platform analysis or another approach. And this, of course, applies not only to cross-platform analysis, but any type of uh, research, digital and non-digital. Okay, so I thank you. I am um, asking you if you have any doubts, questions, I invite you to speak now. Yeah. Hi there. Hi, Ricardo. <laughs> Thanks for this lecture. I have actually uh, two questions. The first one regards your research that it's really interesting. Just wanted to ask uh, one thing because you downloaded um, uh, pictures from both uh, Facebook and Instagram. I just wanted to ask you if then the analysis that you carried out was uh, basically a qualitative content analysis, uh, like the one uh, that we saw yesterday with uh, uh, Lucia Bainotti and Lier Rama. And the second, uh, and how do you go through it? And the second question regards the differences uh, between different platforms, because still I, I really like the approach and it's really interesting to study, you know, events and topics across platforms. At the same time, I ask myself, how can I, as a researcher, take into account all the differences between platform because every platform has its own affordances, right? So basically it hides contents, you know, it pick up and choose contents, it hides certain contents. Uh, and this is also relevant uh, regarding which post becomes popular and, um, you know, also the reputations of the post and, and so on. So it's, uh, no, I can see this as, as a real uh, as a real issue uh, as a researcher, and if you could expand a little bit on that, thanks. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. And the first one uh, question, uh, I'd say yes, I did mostly uh, content analysis. Uh, let's say that a qualitative visual analysis is, I mean, basically the same as the textual content analysis. Basically, you come up with relevant categories and you tag the um, your uh, your material against it what i did was to uh, rely heavily on existing literature to understand which um, aspects of memes were more relevant and i searched for them during the, the 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 tagging procedure so for example humor of course irony is a very relevant uh, aspect is one of the building blocks, let's say, of memes, but the way it can be expressed can be very dif uh, different. So, for example, you have a more literal type of irony, um, mainly relying on um, playfulness of words, uh, homonymity, double meanings, and so on, and another uh, which uh, involves instead 
cross-cultural intertextual references. So you have to have a whole set of knowledge to understand it because they are quoting um, elements from pop culture. So that's just an example, but I took irony as a relevant category and I tagged them uh, on the basis of the different irony expressed. So that for the qualitative part. As a preliminary step, I performed some semi-automated or automated analysis like um, the one um, with peaks plot, uh, basically because I wanted to see at a glance the different visual styles. It's nothing more than that actually, because of course of also always with um, automated approaches, much is left to interpretation. So you just I just created this image map and I saw what what I could derive from it. So that's simply it. I applied this two step approach, let's say. And as for the second question, could you um, please be a little bit more specific? Well, no, just uh, it was just uh, OK, like if if you follow an hashtag, OK, okay so and um, Basically, you're trying, as what I understood is that you're trying to to understand, uh, you know, different social imaginaries, uh, uh, different cultures uh, around um, around the topic, or maybe the same culture on different platforms. Okay, so let let's say how how people develop shared imaginaries uh, uh, regarding a certain topic. Okay, and uh, this is extremely interesting. Also, because we know that you know maybe on different platforms there can be different publics. Okay, so I know that on Facebook I might find the people that are older, uh, millennials on Instagram, and uh, different different audiences on TikTok. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the furnaces of the platform are real. I mean, restructure the flow of communication, as we know. And uh, so, how can I don't know how to make it in another in a different way, but how can we take into account all the different, I mean, the differences between platforms? So how how platforms really structure the flow of communication? It's, I mean, it looks to me something very difficult. Of course, it has to be, um, you have to take them into account. Uh, the fact is that you cannot eliminate the differences among them. And at a certain point, you need simply to acknowledge that in the methodology. You can direct specifically your query on the basis of your research question. So for example, if you know, if you're looking for like a generations and you know that a user base is prominent in one platform than in another, and this comes of course from the literature as well as of course, we all have a basic knowledge, uh, implicit knowledge or of how platforms are structured, but I would advise you to rely once again on the literature to actually justify uh, the fact that you're choosing a specific methodology for a specific uh, platform going, I mean, the fact that you are, of course, selecting to follow an hashtag on Instagram rather than on Facebook is intuitive, but there are uh, actually studies that tells you hashtags are relevant on Instagram rather than on Facebook. So just motivate your choice. And then you, of course, you want, you will never find the perfect solution. You just need to acknowledge that your path as a motivation, you just, it didn't come out of your mind on the spot. And then you try to, as I was saying, for the slide of um, limitations, most of those limitations or problems, you just have to cope with them at a, to a certain extent. And guide, just try to be guided by your research question. And you can al always, in some cases, exploit the affordances in your favor and not always against your work. Now, if you, again, if you, I'm just talking about on the basis of my experience, if you have some practical examples on which you would like to, I don't know, this, which you would like to discuss with me, I invite you to be even more specific so that we can really tackle the issue 
on this podcast. It was, it was really a general question. So thank you very much for your reply. If I can, Julia, take uh, one minute to say something. Can you yes. read that? Can you hear me? Okay. I, I hear you very yes, in the distance. Uh, it's a terrible microphone, but this is, uh, is this any better? A little bit. Is this any better? <laughs> like, <laughs> now, yes. Okay. This Try eating like the a, microphone. I'm, a, I'm an Instagram story uh, producer now. Okay, whatever. So uh, Ricardo's question is helpful because it taps into uh, some other questions that I've received over the course of the week. And I think uh, it is important to stress a uh, point that Alessandro Caliandro made in the lecture that he gave. Uh, that is, uh, we never have to forget that digital methods should be conceived first and foremost as an approach to do social research online. So the same kind of uh, specific attention that we give in the uh, design and motivating and justifying uh, the process of social research that we uh, employ with quantitative and qualitative approaches uh, must be put into a digital method research. Uh, the same processual attention, the same kind of, uh, at, let's say again, attention uh, to uh, the different steps that have been undertaken in doing the research, and uh, on a theoretical level, the same precision in being aware that we cannot uh, infer something from the data if we don't have the data that allow us to, to say uh, that particular uh, conclusion. So, um, I mean, just to only very simply to say uh, the same kind of uh, research design principles uh, that are overarching to social research in general apply also to digital methods and to the kind of uh, different uh, uh, experimentations, let's say, that we, um, that we show you this week. Thank you, Ale. Thank you. Yes, sometimes I feel like it's really, I don't know, it's just that this kind of uh, things are, deal, are, are mostly dealt with when you really have to do a research and talking about it on a theoretical point of view, on a theoretical level is really difficult sometimes, <laughs> sometimes for me. And in general, my advice is always, you know, go for the... Uh, doubtful and transparent side so uh, it's better to be more uh, open about the process and uh, explain what uh, has been done than less uh, and uh, and and then you know if you are critical and self-reflexive about the research process uh, and take into account the different specific criticalities for instance that concern an individual platform or a, the cross-platform uh, um, analysis that you have done and of course uh, combine different criticalities of individual platforms into one single research design this self-reflexive approach is always good is always productive yes now i take you to my thousand followers ah. any other question <clears throat> doubt critics Sorry, I don't want to monopolize really, but I, I, I want to add something. Um, I think cross-platform analysis compared to what we have seen before uh, you, Julia, ha is newer. Uh, so we are still as, you know, as a research community involved in digital methods. So not just us, but also people in Amsterdam and people in, in Australia, uh, in Spain, where, where there are different research uh, communities about digital methods doing their own thing, so to speak, um, is um, cross platform analysis is newer. So we are all uh, still in a very sort of relatively experimental phase about yeah. how to actually do cross platform analysis. And I think uh, including cross platform analysis in a school like this is a, uh, is a challenge in some way because we also are in experimental, in an experimental phase. So maybe the conversations and projects and activities that we do together will also uh, you know contribute to do this better not just for you but also for us so um, it is uh, it is really a new territory new sociological territory 
uh, that uh, that has a degree of complications of complication precisely because of the different uh, features of each platform uh, which are difficult to take into account in isolation uh, can you imagine in combination so um, again any question and insight is appropriate because it uh, is uh, something that will contribute to the, to the development of an approach that I expect will take up in the years to come. Mm -mm. And the fact that the literature was lacking of whatsoever contribution is indicative of what you were saying. So it's completely new. And yeah, I concur with what you say. Um, but if there are no other questions or um, comments, I would like to show you um, the things I was talking about. So I'm sorry for the nostalgia group. They have, they've already seen most of them. Um, but maybe this one is new. So uh, this is the meme gene. And it's actually a website. I put the link in the slides, as I was saying. And it's actually um, yeah, a website when you can perform a search uh, on memes that have been published on Reddit. And it's mm, nice because mm, the search is actually performed on not only uh, on the text type, title, uh, on the text in the title, sorry, but also uh, on the text in the image. And it's, uh, if you click on the image, I won't, but if you click on the images, uh, you are redirected to the um, subreddit and the actual discussion uh, from which it was uh, taken. And this is nice if you want to, for example, map the diffusion of a meme. Um, the backside is that is only on Reddit. So maybe it can be useful as an explorative step of an analysis where you want to identify the relevant uh, subreddit. It's mostly memes, but not, not only that. There are memes um, on which the memes uh, were published. So this is quite nice. It's similar to what Crotangle does uh, for the meme search. But again, Crotangle, maybe I didn't mention that, or that I didn't uh, make that explicit, is uh, only for um, PhD students and above. So researchers in general, uh, you can apply if you want uh, to use this tool. This one I'm showing you is uh, free. So the second one, um, the second tool is Pixplot as I was saying, is a libra library on Python. Um, I've, I've written, again, I've put the link in the slides, but I, I think there is uh, a reference also in the welcome package tools. And I'm showing you uh, just the output. Of So this is the uh, one of the outcomes I got from part of my uh, of the data collection of my thesis. These are all memes, specifically Italian memes. What you do is uh, you simply feed the algorithm a folder containing images, and the output is an image map with clusters based on pixel similarity again and um, the biggest feature is maybe that uh, these images are clustered in different groups which are listed here and once you select them you are uh, automatically selecting the area in the map corresponding that this one is showing better than the other ones um, corresponding to that cluster again as i was saying to ricardo much is left to the to your interpretation but you can see that the first clusters 
are um, better defined as the others. So if you click on it, it zooms in. And this is all related to comics, cartoons, um, while the second one to real life people, mostly politicians, but also um, uh, celebrities. Um, yeah. And if you click on the image, double click. Okay, wrong example. However, uh, you can visualize the the image um, full screen. You can even download a subset with this uh, tool. You can highlight the images you're interested in, and you can download them. You can download only the names. Um, other specificities are. Okay. Uh, that instead of a um, of a cluster map, you can visualize a grid. It's less informative uh, from my point of view, but again, um, you can order alphabetically the images, and that's a feature you can also do with image sorter, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this one uh, is useless now, but if we had categorized the image. The images um, with a sensible criterion, maybe we should be able to um, see some of them. Now you can see some of them um, depending on the label. Let's go back to the other one. Can increase the point size, which I always do. And this one, uh, this is the date actually. Um, in the format of a timestamp. And if you slide, you can see actually when the memes, in this case, or the images were published. So you can see there are basically two waves here. Here it stops and then other memes were created. And it's, like, it's nice, again, it's a way to process a lot of visual information at once and maybe start um, dig into it um, with a nice tool and a nice uh, visualization. So again, if you're interested in using this tool, I, the, I mean, the, um, there is the GitHub um, page related to it, uh, which with step-by-step instructions on how to install and run it. Uh, also, the developers are really um, active. So if you have uh, any issue, you just report it and they will reply within hours, really. It's amazing. Um, yes, the other tool is the meme specter, which is actually a downloadable interface. Um, a graphic interface like this one. Uh, again, you can download it <clears throat> from the related GitHub. It's a really new tool because it was released uh, maybe less than a month ago. Yes, some weeks ago. So um, everything is new, also the issues. <laughs> Be careful with that. I, I encountered an issue yesterday. People in the group, uh, in the nostalgia group, already know. Um, but again, um, I'm going to show you the general functioning. So, uh, by the way, uh, the people in the nostalgia group, the developer responded. It should be all uh, resolved now. So you should install the latest version, maybe. He fixed the patch um, with the Google Vision API, which you didn't uh, um, run into because you didn't use it. But again, uh, what does uh, this mean specter do? Uh, despite the name, it does not actually uh, identify memes within a visual data set. That's a bummer. Um, it is simply an image tagger. So what, what you do is to, you select 
the algorithm uh, or the model with which you want to uh, tag your images. Be careful because the first three ones are paid option. So you have to, uh, I mean, always here in the GitHub, there are detailed instructions. So I will not uh, go into much detail with it. You have to obtain the credentials by registering on the platform like Vision API, Azure, Clarify. And be careful that you have a, an amount of free images to tag, and then you will pay for this service. If you select one of these paid option, you get to select the features against which you want your images to be tagged. So for example, not suitable for work content, face recognition, and in this case, you have an arrange of facial emotion, uh, facial emotions that are, that are recognized, label, so content uh, analysis, automated uh, content analysis, uh, web cross-links, uh, text recognized through OCR, uh, the OCR technique, that is the optical recognition technique, uh, landmark logos uh, to recognize brands and the others, as you can see, I've only tried Google Vision, but the others are actually uh, similar in the features. And, but lucky for you, we also have open sources models. We have quite a bit of them. And the differences between them is just in the algorithm again. Um, I've tried two of them so far. So the first one and ResNet, um, and they, they the outputs were quite similar. So I don't know, I, I haven't tried them all, but I guess that the outputs are really similar. So uh, the on the bright side, so you can, you don't need to pay to tag your images. Uh, on the downside, uh, the uh, reliability of the open source models is not the same as the paid services. Uh, of course. So uh, sometimes as the people of the nostalgia group are already have already experienced, um, the outcome can be an informative. But I'm, I'm showing you an example of the outcome and at the end, uh, what you do is really easy. You select files from your computer, you select a folder from your computer, you simply import the images from the web. Once you have uh, imported them, you get two outputs. The one is the JSON files uh, file, uh, one is a CSV file. You can rename and decide the uh, path uh, on which it will be saved, and then you simply run it. What you get here is an example. Okay. Uh, here are 15 images. I will show you the images in a bit that I've tagged with it. And I used here the free option, ResNet 50. And I've done the same with Vision API. What are the differences? Uh, as you can see, the ResNet option only gives you uh, the labels. Okay, here is known information where was the image originally, uh, what was the name of it, and whether the process was successful or not, and then a bunch of labels, as you can see, with the related uh, probability scores of that label actually being relevant. As you can see, they are not very high, and that uh, what I was talking about before, the reliability of the open source is not that great. With the Vision API, the thing is quite different. Um, again, you have the image name, then you have, uh, again, uh, a confirmation of the successful process, of the process being successful or not. Some cases it wasn't. Um, and then you have adult content, 
and and what it gives you is like a BDT probability score again, very unlikely, very unlikely, unlikely, and so on. And this is nice because um, there are some, in some cases the, the algorithm was not so sure that this content was not uh, so. I mean, it was um, sure because it's still unlikely. It's not so so strongly. Uh, confident that the content uh, was not um, for adult. And this is in the case of these two images, which actually are these ones. So I specifically picked these ones because I, I knew it could have caused some problem, like in this one. And in this one, which is actually dressed um, old Charlie's Angels cast, but again, the recognition was not so sure. Unlikely, but not so unlikely. And then you have again um, other uh, sensitive contents. And what I was talking about before in the cases where he, uh, when the, the algorithm recognized um, in faces, for each face, um, it says, okay, this is unlikely, uh, an anger, expressing anger, and so on and so forth. Okay, you have pretty confident score in most cases. And then labels once again. Aside from that, uh, logo recognition, not so reliable, I've checked in this case. Uh, text recognition, we didn't need that uh, in the nostalgia group. We already uh, were provided with text, um, with the image text from uh, Craftangle. And another pretty feature is this one, entity recognition. Um, here, it recognized Tom Cruise. It did recognize Tom Cruise, it did recognize uh, the old Charlie's Angels cast. It didn't recognize the other two actors on the hallway and Dylan all. And that's it. Okay, so this is just a quick overview of what it does and what it does not do. Um, again, if you are interested in these other tool, uh, again, the, the information, the instruction are contained in the package, in the welcome package of the summer school. And with that, I, uh, I, I conclude my lecture. Hope you enjoyed it. Are there any final questions or comments or clarification requests or applauses? Or saying applause, which makes you know makes me happy anyway. So good. Thank you. It is um, ten twenty-three, and uh, uh, we are a bit ahead of schedule, surprisingly, which uh, which is good. So I guess we can take a slightly longer break if everyone agrees, and uh, reconvene at ten forty-five. So we can be still ahead of schedule and go for lunch earlier if we can make it. Uh, at 10.45, we might, uh, we will welcome Beatrice Gobbo, who I see lurking around um, here. Uh, it makes me happy too. Uh, Beatrice is uh, working with me in a, a research project called Algo Count. I will tell you a little bit more about that and our work later. And she will give us a lecture about data visualization, which I'm sure you will enjoy. So see you in a minute, in actually in 20 minutes, more or less, for uh, Beatrice's lecture. I will stop the recording now.